Welcome to the podcast that will teach you how to successfully invest in and build steady streams of passive income from the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Veteran real estate investors Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart from Mobile Home Park Academy will personally share with you the valuable lessons they've learned along their journey as mobile home park investors so that you too can learn how to build massive cash flow and huge profits from this extremely lucrative niche. So without further ado, let's welcome your hosts for today's show, Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart. Welcome, guys and gals, to the Mobile Home Park Academy's weekly podcast, where we'll provide all the information that you need to know to successfully locate, negotiate, close on, and make huge profits from the lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. I'm your host, Kevin Bupp, along with my co-host and business partner, Charles DeHart. Charles, I'm not going to ask you what the word is, but what's going on, man? Yeah, nothing much, dude. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm I'm ready to start talking today about uh, about tenant screening. You know, we've gotten a lot of people that have reached out to us over the past month or so, and uh, even lots of internal discussions that we've had with our on-site managers about screening the best tenants. I mean, this is one of those uh, this is one of those topics that I wouldn't say it's overly exciting it's exciting to talking talk about, but it's one of those things that it's it's a necessary evil because, as you know, uh, we buy a lot of parks that have um, challenging tenants in place. And so um, mm-hmm. the way we turn those things around is we implement the right systems and processes to pre-screen and basically you know put up a wall or barrier to keep those bad people out and bring the good ones in. So um, yeah, man, I'm excited to talk about it. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Definitely not a riveting subject, but it's a good one. It's it's a quality subject to go over nonetheless. You know, it's riveting when you actually get the right <laughs> systems in place and then you realize that you've got this park full of people that pay on time and don't do drugs and don't cause problems. <laughs> and this yeah, that's over- that's that's when it turns good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you're putting a bunch of money in your pocket, but it's 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 not fun when you're actually in the transitional stage like we have gone through so many times. You know, but for us we kinda know what to look for. We know pretty quickly how to weed out the bad ones. I mean it's it's not it's not necessarily a science, but it kind of is to a certain extent. But uh, a lot of it comes down to just a lot of common sense. I mean, it's really, I'd say most of it hinges on common sense. You know, when you're looking at like a credit report or you're looking at a background of somebody, and you're determining whether or not they're actually going to qualify to live in your community. So um, anyway, we're going to cover all that in depth today. But before we get on to the to the show here today, Charles, I have just a couple laundry list items that we'll try to roll through here really quickly. Um, the first one is uh, we're just weeks away from rolling out uh, some very exciting investment opportunities for accredited investors via our new mobile home park fund. So I know you guys have heard us talking about this, but it's literally uh, it, as of next week. And so this show is going to air on Tuesday. And as of next week, this fund should be live and open for business. So if you guys have any interest whatsoever in partnering with Charles and I on future deals, shoot us an email to partner at mobilehomeparkacademy.com. And um, that, that just so you know, that's an autoresponder email. So almost immediately, you'll actually be sent info on our current offerings. Now, I'll tell you that we haven't updated this yet. And we're waiting till next week until our fund goes live. Uh, at, once you get that autoresponder email, you'll see that we have one opportunity in there. It's a, a two-park portfolio in West Virginia uh, in Charleston, West Virginia that we have under contract. But we actually have multiple other parks under contract. Uh, I think four others in total. And uh, just got an answer back on an LOI we wrote today for a very large 195 space park here in Florida. So we're um, we're making deals happen. We're getting parks tied up. And so we're very excited about this fund. And uh, so if you have any interest in learning about this uh, opportunity, to work together, shoot an email to partner at mobilehomeparkacademy.com. And then um, in that in that email that you'll get in that all responder, there will be a, a, an actual link to a calendar. And so if you have an interest in actually talking to us about this opportunity and potentially working together, just schedule a time and we'll get on the phone together. And I can tell you that, um, you know, Charles, this is a, this fund we're putting together, it's it's unique in nature because most funds are just basically the you know the sponsors or the general partners which kind of run the show, and then there's the limited partners which are the the money guys. You know they're the passive investors, but typically there's no involvement uh, from a from a limited partner standpoint or the passive investors like they don't really learn the business. So if you're going to be a limited partner in a syndication, let's say it's an apartment syndication, you can't expect going into it knowing that you're going to get to know the business because you're not. You're just literally putting your money up and uh, we call that mailbox money. I mean, that's basically what happens. You'll get a you get a check every month or every quarter or once a year along with reports on how that investment's going, but you don't get to learn anything about the apartment business when you get involved in the syndication. And so, but ours is going to be some 
somewhat of a hybrid model. As you guys know, Tar- Charles and I have been working on the academy uh, where we're going to be offering education on how to invest in this business or how to actually get started in the mobile home park business. And so for those that actually in- invest in our fund and partner with us on a fund, we are going to give free access to the academy, which is going to be pretty awesome. So you'll actually get the, for those that want to learn the business, you have the opportunity to learn the business, but you also have the ability to partner with us on deals that we're doing and make money while you're learning. So Charles, I don't know if you've ever seen anything out there like that, but I think it's kind of unique and I think it's pretty cool because we've had a lot of people that have shown an interest in learning the business, but they also want to invest with us. And so um, I think it's a cool way for us to scale and work with a lot of people, but also teach them the business at the same time. So Yeah, I think it's a super unique. I, I've never seen that before. So I'm definitely excited to put that on. Yeah. And so that kind of leads into <laughs> the, to the next laundry slide, which is the academy itself. <laughs> I know we've been talking about this, but it's finally here. It really is. I, and so I say that I'm going to tell you that we're releasing it next week. And so, um, but more than likely, it actually might come out this week. But I just don't want to get your hopes up. We'll work through some final kinks, um, but it will be out here in the next week or so. Okay. Um, it's really been a labor of love for Charles and I over the past year and a half. And um, it, it's really one that we're proud to bring to everyone You know that, that wants to learn how to create massive wealth in this higher lucrative niche, because we know that it's possible. Um, we've got some really cool systems in the process that we've put in place over the years. And so we're just super excited to actually make this thing come alive and, and teach others you know, how to do what we do. So, you know, so in addition to this academy launch that we're working on, Charles, I know that we've also spent a lot of time on this, uh, this two hour training that we put together, which we're going to, we're actually going to make available to you guys for free. It's going to be a free two hour training that we put together, um, as kind of a, called a, um, I don't know what do you want to call it, Charles. It's, it's somewhat of like a taste of what you could expect from our academy. And so we put this together as just kind of a, uh, preliminary educational, uh, program so you can kind of see what it is we're going to be doing in the academy, but also actually the two hour training itself, Charles actually is very in depth and very informative. And so Mm -hmm. on this two hour training that we've created, which we'll make available here in the next week, we're going to teach you, um, very in depth of how we, you know, how we analyze markets and how we find the best markets to invest. And we're going to talk very in depth about, um, how Charles, Charles, like our database wizard. And so he's going to go very in depth about how we build our comprehensive mobile home park database. And then last but not least in this training, there's gonna be like three steps of it. Last but not least, we're going to teach about, how after you have the markets, after you have the database created, how do you market to it effectively? Like how do you get your phone ring off the hooks and keep a steady stream of deal uh, deal flow coming in of high quality leads? And so it's a two hour training. It's not just a bunch of fluff or anything like that. We put a lot of time and energy into that. And again, it's just going to be kind of the uh, somewhat of a taste of what you could expect from the full blown academy. So just look for that over the next week. It will be available on our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com. And we'll also have a dedicated link to it as well, which we'll share more than likely next week. But just keep your ears open and uh, we'll let you know how you can get access to that and oh uh, let's see charles what, what other laundry do we have to do here what, what else do we have to cover before we get on to the uh, the show let's see here I don't know. oh two oh, more if things. you're in the tampa bay area yeah two more things yeah. tampa if you if you if you're visiting tampa you're coming into tampa bay charles and i were based in clearwater we'd love to meet with you and we love meeting others in this business so if you're coming here and you got some extra time shoot us an email to mobile home park academy at gmail.com and let us know when you're coming and um you'll see if we can coordinate our schedules and then last but not least if you are an active mobile home park investor today and you, ha- you own at least one park we'd love to have you on the show as you as you can see uh we've had guests now over the past couple of weeks actually past couple of months that have come on they've shared their story shared their experience um hope you guys enjoyed the the show we did last week with uh with clint grime um he's the one that actually purchased the park that i passed up on so when i still kick myself in the butt for each and every day uh, but uh, that was a pretty cool show but we'd love to actually interview you if you're, if you're a park owner and you're an operator again you don't it doesn't have to be a huge park you don't have to own 10 parks or 100 parks or anything like that um we just want to talk to you and understand your experience understand your your journey that you went through to purchase that park so reach out to us uh shoot an email mobile home park academy at gmail.com and let's talk let's talk about your your experience and let's see about having you on the show as a guest so uh, charles that's all the laundry man it's clean and uh it's time to get on to the real reason why everyone's listening in to us <laughs> today okay they don't like just to hear our voices but they want to hear they want to come in and get some good information yeah what they, they want the content so. yeah yeah <laughs> so um so anyway so this, this show today is about pre-screening and, and just vetting residents for your for your mobile home parks and so 
Uh, let's just dive right into it. I mean, there's multiple steps to this. Uh, we're not necessarily going to go in any kind of sequential order here. Um, these are all kind of the things that I, that I look for. I do a lot of the pre-screening um, in our communities. Like, you know, or typically the application will come in through a manager. The manager will, you know, will, will be the one that's showing the, the, the unit, the rental unit or the unit that's for sale to a prospective resident. They'll get the applications. But actually our system, um, some of our managers do pull credit, but most of the time I actually run the back end there. I mean, we don't have that that much deal flow. We don't have hundreds of applications of the week. So it's it's actually not, it's not to the point to where it's not scalable for me just to kind of get an eye on what's happening behind the scenes. And so I'm the one that sees a lot of these credit reports. I'm the one that um, a lot of times, you know, makes the final determination of whether or not someone qualifies to live in our community or one of our communities. And so, um, you know, the, the first thing that I say that we do when a new applicant comes in and they actually apply or they fill out an application is, you know, assuming that it looks like they might qualify based on the information that they've shared is, uh, is, is we'll just go in and actually check with a prior landlord. We'll literally look at the reference they have on there, where they're currently living today, and make some phone calls. Make some phone calls on, um, you know, what their previous rental history looks like. Talk to the, the landlord they're living with or they're dealing with right now or talk to a previous landlord if they've got a couple listed on there and, and find out what they have to say, you know, what they have to say about this, this applicant, you know, are they good, are they bad, are they ugly. Mm-hmm. Now I will tell you this, that this is one thing that I've noticed Charles um, over the years, over the many years I've been doing this is um, you know, whenever there's a, uh, a prospective applicant or a prospective resident that actually rents from a private owner, a lot of times that's, there's a challenge there because here's where the challenge lies. If it's a private owner and this resident has not been a good tenant, they either haven't paid on time or they've just been a pain in the butt. A lot of times it's hard to take the private owner's word for it, <laughs> whether or not they're good tenants. You know, they yep. just, you know, a lot of times a private owner might lie because they want that tenant out of their house as fast as possible. They want them going somewhere else. And so what we typically do uh, a lot of times is, well, number one, we'll ask about, you know, how, how, how good of a tenant they've been. Have they, you know, have they taken care of the place? Do they pay on time? Um, you know, would they rent to them again? Just very basic questions. Um, but then we, in addition to that, we also verify that the person we're speaking with is the person that actually owns the home. You know, if, if we're dealing with the directly with the, the property owner, if it's a property management company, that's pretty easy to verify. But we'll go into public records and actually verify ownership, make sure we're not just talking to one of the, uh, the applicant's buddies or friends or something like that. So, mm-hmm. um, that's something very important to do, but you know you want to check with these prior landlords and just find out how these prospective residents that want to move into your community how, how well they've done and if their previous landlords would rent to them again, you know, given the chance. So, Charles, any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think that's that's kind of first and foremost because if you get, I know that we've had some people in the past that the, you know the landlord have been you know, they would say, well, you know what, they've got this you know, this ginormous pit bull, and you know I've been I've been trying to get money out of them. I'm about to start the eviction. You know, it's kind of like okay, well. Tall tale sign. Let's red flags up in the air. Let's just not. Let's not even take this application. Let's not even process this thing because they're not going to make it here. If that's how they are with their current landlord, right? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here from the Mobile Home Park Academy. I'm very sorry for interrupting your show, but I have something really special I'd like to share with you. If you haven't heard already, Charles and I are offering something really cool here at the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast, and I just wanted to make sure that you knew about it. We're offering a free 30-minute phone consultation with the two of us, where you can ask us anything that you like about mobile home park investing. Maybe you're brand new and you just have a few questions that you'd like answered. Or maybe you want to run a deal past us and have us help you walk through the evaluation process. Or maybe you're an already experienced park owner and you just want to bounce a few ideas off of us. Whatever it is, Charles and I, we're very excited to speak with you. And there's absolutely no ulterior motive with these calls, so you don't need to worry about us trying to upsell you or pitch you on some kind of product or service. These calls are simply our way of giving back and connecting with others who share our same passion for this business. And just to reiterate, it doesn't matter if you're brand new or a seasoned investor. These calls are open to everyone. But there is one catch. It has to relate to mobile home parks. And so if you'd like to schedule that free 30-minute call with Charles and I, please send an email to freecall at mobilehomeparkacademy.com. Again, free call at mobilehomeparkacademy.com, and almost immediately you'll receive an email back with a link to our calendar. And if you haven't received that email within five minutes or so, be sure to check your junk folder, okay? Sometimes it ends up there. And when you go to schedule that time on our calendar, please include a little background on yourself as well as what you'd like to discuss on our call, but please be sure that it relates to mobile home parks. Charles and I really look forward to connecting with you, and we look forward to helping you in your journey to success as a mobile home park investor. Now let's get back to the show. 
Yeah, I mean, there's some liability too. From you got to you got to think about it from the uh, you know the previous landlord's perspective. There's some liability if they, you know, trash the pre you know trash the tenant that you're screening, and uh, that tenant doesn't get accepted. There is some liability that comes sure. with that. So a lot of landlords won't even won't even really get too in depth when you ask them uh, certain questions about their character or their behavior as a renter. So yep, yep. no, that's, that's very true, and so that that's why. You kind of take everything with a grain of salt. You have to do. You have to check those references. But after that, we move on to actually pulling the credit. We pull a full blown credit report and a background check, and uh, we do a, a, a national background check or criminal check. So we don't just do like the county that they're living in or the county that the, the mobile home parks in, but we do it nationwide. Okay, and so you know the question that we get a lot when we when we pull credit, a lot of people that are new to this business or just new to being a landlord, they'll ask, you know. How important or how relevant is credit score when it comes to qualifying these residents or these potential residents that want to live in your community? And I, I will tell you this. I, you know, you have to understand that being in the mobile home park business, we are dealing with affordable housing. And so we're typically dealing with a clientele base that might not be the, um, I don't want to say most responsible, Charles. That's not the right word for it. But, you know, they... These are individuals that work, you know, minimum wage jobs. You know, they make ten or maybe even twelve dollars an hour, fifteen. I mean, they don't have, you know, they're not white collar. A lot of times, they're not they're not making sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, they might not have, uh, you know, formal educations and such. And so, you'll find that there's always going to be a lot of times credit blips there. You know, there's always going to be some kind of you know collection here and there that might have a, a, a negative credit score for something that happened in the past. And so, I can tell you that for me, Charles credit score really isn't relevant. What what I'm looking for is I'm looking for their ability to pay on time and to repay the debt that they're about to take on. I mean, that's mm-hmm. really it. I, I want to know that they have the ability and also a responsible, have the financial responsibility to pay on time and the ability to repay the debt. I mean, that, that's really it. I, could, I don't even look at the credit score. Just, I, I just literally cross it out of my mind when I'm looking at their credit report. Forget the credit score. I want to look at what their credit history looks like, not the credit score itself. Do you have any thoughts on that, Charles? Yeah, I mean a lot of the a lot of the you can't expect perfect out of uh, the people that are going to be living in your communities. I mean, a lot of the people that we cater to, they you know these these people live paycheck to paycheck. They have no reserves built up. So, you know, if if something happens, any any hiccup that happens in their life, uh, a lot of times that gets reflected on their credit report. They can't make payments to their credit cards for you know a month or two or or whatever. So a lot of these people they they do have some rocky credit. Um, but, but really, you know, you're, you're looking for some very specific things, which we'll get into a little bit later on, uh, about, you know, what they've been delinquent on and, and, and how they've handled those situations. So Mm -hmm. I think you just have to go in with an open mind when you, when you read someone's credit report in this business. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the important thing for me is like their debt to income, you know, like I want to know Mm -hmm. how much current debt or how many, you know, how much monthly obligations they have also including the you know, potential monthly payment they're going to take on in our community um, versus how much gross income they make on a monthly basis. And I want to see, and that's why, you know, on our applications, we actually have them list out like, you know, cell phones, car insurance, and, you know, whatever else, you know, errands, rentals, whatever it might be. You know, we have them list out everything on every monthly obligation. And because a lot of, some of that stuff doesn't even come up on credit. You know, some of those monthly obligations like cell phones, for instance, they won't come up on credit reports. The only time they'll come up on a credit report is if, if they've uh, you know, derogatory, if they've, they've skipped a payment, or they actually have, it's gone to collection. That's about the only time you'll see like an AT and T or Verizon mm-hmm. or T Mobile or something like that pop up. And so, uh, we want to know that their debt to income doesn't exceed forty five percent of their gross monthly income, meaning the rent payment that they're going to incur with us, including all their other monthly obligations, car payments, car insurance, cell phone, um, you know, and any other kind of personal loans or automobile loans that they might have, uh, credit card payments and such, it doesn't exceed 45%. That's kind of what we're looking for. Um, you know, there might be exceptions to the rule here and there, but that's typically our gauge. That, that's what we go from. Now, mm-hmm. um, so assuming that they actually make that cut. You know, they, they actually, their debt to income doesn't exceed the 45%. Now we kind of move on to what their financial history looks like. Like, I, again, I always use the word financial responsibility, okay? And here's what I mean by that. So there's different sections I look for. Number one, there's a couple big red flags for me that just like literally they, they throw the flag up and I, and I really start scrutinizing the credit port a lot more. And that first red flag is utility provider. So like if you see that there's actually collections on a credit report from a gas company, from an electric company, from a telephone company or such, 
that's just for me that's a, it's a big concern because you're talking like you know for, for instance like electric company or even a water company or a utility provider if they don't pay those bills and those bills go to collection that means it's, that means at some point in time that utility got shut off that mean they, they either their water got cut off their electricity got cut off and that that's concerning charles i mean if, if they get really got that that much in dire straits so where they let one of their major utilities get cut off that's a concern to me you know I, do you yep. feel that way as well yeah i mean you know, when people get in trouble, when they get in financial trouble, they usually let the things they don't care much about, uh, they let that stuff kind of go into default first. You know, that's what people normally do when they when they start having problems is they let all the things they really don't need. But, you know, you need electricity, you need water, you need housing. So when you start seeing some of that stuff on a credit report, then you know that they have either they're very unstable or they just really just don't care. Yeah, uh, whether or not they pay those things or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then the next thing we look at is credit cards. And here's here's how I determine financial responsibility for credit cards is if they have a credit card, that's one thing. But if I see that if I see that they've got credit cards that um, they've maxed out, like a lot of initial credit limits that are given to people that are just getting established is like a five hundred, a three or five hundred dollars. That's a pretty common uh, credit limit amount. And if I start seeing a pattern of where they had multiple credit cards opened in a you know period of a couple of years, they basically run the cards up to their base, you know, to their to their credit limit, and then defaulted. And then that that credit card is either currently in collections or is currently you know sixty, ninety, hundred twenty days behind. That's financial irresponsibility. That that's concerning. I mean, that means that they just could care less about credit, and they could care less about the responsibility of paying back their debtors. So um, that's a big red flag for me. The next one would be federal tax liens. I know Charles, we just had uh, a recent applicant in one of our communities that had about a hundred thousand dollars worth of federal tax liens, and uh, he was a self-employed uh, consultant of some type. And um, you know, the concern with that one is a. Uh, there's a good chance he might end up in federal prison. <laughs> he had four years worth of uh, federal tax liens, and he owed <laughs> a lot of money to the federal government. And uh, um, you know, there, there's garnishments that can happen there, and then there's a chance that he might end up in federal prison. So, if I'm going to let him come in our community, there's a chance that he might get removed pretty soon, or there's a chance that like the income that he has that, that supposedly is going to go for paying rent might get garnished. And it's going to affect his ability to pay us on time. So, uh, and also being that he's not even responsible enough to actually pay his taxes as he should and file in a timely manner, it's a big concern of mine as well. Charles, what, what were your thoughts on that one? I know that, that 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 for me was a big concern. How about for you? Yeah, it is a big concern. I mean, the, the federal government with federal taxes, I mean, a lot of times people get, get behind as much as this person did is, you know, they'll work out payment plans and Maybe if you're still considering a person with that, you ask about the payment plans and, and try to see some proof of that so you can more accurately uh, calculate their debt to income. But, um, yeah, you don't want to mess around with federal the, the federal government and, and their taxes. So mm-hmm. you can end up in some, some pretty big trouble for that. And if they got a payment plan already set up, make sure that they've actually seasoned it a little bit, meaning they've made some payments on it. Like if they just set yeah. up like last week and they say, well, hey, I got a payment plan, I'm going to start paying them. Well, Good, yeah. You know, I mean, that, that good intention and all, but you know, is that are you really going to pay it, or did you just do it because you know you're looking for a place to live? And um, so, anyway, you might you might want to see that that season and that they made a few payments before you really use that as proof. Uh, the next big thing, uh, Charles, that are red flags to me are judgments from apartment complexes. You know, you'll see a judgment that might be from like you know ABC apartment complex. A lot of times, that that's for one of two reasons. That's either because they skipped out on a lease meaning that there was still a term left on the lease agreement that they initially signed, or when they left that unit, they left it damaged. And there was actually repairs that needed to be done, and, and the apartment complex filed a judgment against them. So big red flag there. And, and you know, almost there really isn't a circumstance to where, unless it was already satisfied, meaning like if that happened, it was on someone's credit, but yet it shows it's satisfied, meaning that they paid it back, I'll make an exception for that, and I'll, I'll listen to the rest of the story. But if they've got judgments on there from apartment complexes um, and it has not been satisfied, that's pretty much null and void in my book. You know, that, 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 that just means that they're either going to skip – they run the risk of skipping out and leaving town on your unit, or they're going to damage your unit, one of the two, okay? Um, the next one are repossessions, uh, repossessions of vehicles. Again, that's another one of those important things. Like Charles mentioned, like, you know, it's kind of the same thing as you know, people have – 
certain requirements or certain you know daily needs or, or, or needs this to live by and you know one is like running water right uh, another one is electricity another one is transportation so those are like the vital things and the last one would be the roof over the head but you know those are like vital things that people need to actually survive at least I mean <laughs> maybe not in primal times but today in today's world that's what they need to survive and you know when I see people that have automobile repossessions it's a big concern to me you know it's just um they let if they're willing to let their car get taken back, uh, in, you know, Charles. I don't know how you feel about it, but for me, it's just a, it's a big red flag and it's a big concern. And a lot of times, I will look at the rest of the story, but a lot of times that is the you know the the null and void factor of whether or not they'll get into our community or not. Yeah, I mean, problems with previous landlords, problems with their housing, utilities, and, and their transportation, all that stuff is, is a really huge red flag uh, for me. I, I don't really mind seeing the credit cards that much. I mean, we you have to you know, bend a little bit in this business, but when, when they're starting to let their cars and their in their place of, you know, where they live and, and their utilities go into default, then that, that really is troubling to me. Yeah. And the, the, one of the things that just never is a concern to me is medical. <laughs> medical is one of those things that I just, I had to skip over it because our healthcare system is horrible. And those that do not have health insurance, basically what happens is they get sick, they go to the hospital, they go to the hospital, they don't pay the bill, it goes to collection. I mean, that, and that's just, that that's how our system works for those that actually can't afford healthcare. And uh, so medical, I typically just glance over. I don't even really consider it. Um, so that, that, that's kind of some of the big red flags that we look for. So let's talk about those that have no credit history. Well, I'm of the mindset, you know, no credit history is better than bad credit history to a certain extent. You know, I still want to know that there's some kind of I don't want to take, you know, 18-year-old Susie who literally lives with her parents, never has owned anything, um, never has made a, a, a payment on anything in her life. Her cell phone's in her parents' name, her car's in her parents' name, her car insurance is in her parents' name, and she wants to live in our unit. But yet she has no proof of uh, financial payment history whatsoever. That's a concern to me. But then you'll find people that are, you know, they're adults and, you know, they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and yet they just, they live by cash. You know, they don't like taking on credit or they don't take it on debt. And um, they've got, pay, they've got some rental history, they've got payment history, but it's all cash. They pay thing, they pay for things in cash. I know we just had someone buy one of our trailers from us uh, a week or two ago. And um, this kind of scenario, no credit history whatsoever, but came in and paid cash, $15,000 for one of our units. And, um, and I'm happy. I mean, he's got a job. He works. He owns his car free and clear. But he had zero credit. Literally, he had no credit rating whatsoever. Um, Charles, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I I, I actually liked uh, in that that situation when you have someone that's in there. I think he was what fifty fifty three years old. Yeah. No credit ever. Mm -hmm. He came in with cash to buy the unit. You know, I, I a person like that, as far as from a landlord perspective, I don't I don't really agree. That's not the way I live my life, but. Um, from a landlord perspective, you can you can kind of tell that that guy thinks through his financial situation uh, very well. That he's never had to utilize credit in his entire life, mm -hmm. um, so he he really thinks through the decisions that he's that he's made. So I don't know. I, I like him. I, I like that uh, that transaction. I think that he's going to probably work out just fine. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay, so. The next thing I want to talk about here, this is uh, I, this could probably take place. This is a little out of order. This could take place when a uh, potential resident come, comes to your community. You need to train your managers on this one. This is like an old landlord trick. Um, the inside of someone's car. Whatever the condition is, and I don't care if it's an old 1970 Oldsmobile, like to where the outside just kind of beat up and old and run down. That doesn't mean that it can't be clean, right? Meaning like it can't be tidy on the inside. And so. Have your managers always inspect the interior of someone's vehicle. If there's like McDonald's bags strewn all over the place and old newspapers and trash and cigarette butts like shoved into the dashboard and, you know, it's just junky and the windows have got like a thick film of like 20 years on them you can't even see in. If that's what it looks like, guess what the inside of your trailer is going to look like? <laughs> and seriously, I mean, that, that, that really is an old landlord trick and it holds true. If someone's willing to drive around that type of filth, they're willing to live in that type of filth as well. And so... Use that as a as, as a gauge. Have your manager teach your managers that. That's so very important. I mean, that really is a. It should be like one of the first determining factors. It's just seeing what the in interior of their car looks like. Okay, um, Charles, have you ever used that trick? I can't believe you haven't heard that before. That, that, that's like an old landlord trick, man. That's that's what you got to do to figure oh, out. I've heard right. of that before. Okay, what okay, are you talking okay, about? okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you, you giggled at me like you never heard. Like I'm crazy by, by saying that. <laughs> we um, use that to identify potential managers too. You know, we absolutely. do that. You know, look at the outside of the house. Look at the inside of the car. 
you know, this might be a potential manager candidate. You know, we, we do some of those things just trying to identify people that could potentially be someone we want to hire in the future, you know? Yeah. So if the interior, if the interior of the car, if they use their ashtray and it's got butts overflowing, the inside of your unit's going to be yellow when you get it back <laughs> from smoke, <laughs> smoke and nicotine stains. So, and that stuff's really hard to get out. And it's really hard. Yep. To, you got to use about, you know, three layers of kills to, to kind of seal that stuff in when you get a unit back. Um, Charles, next, let's, let's talk about job stability. I mean, this is, this goes back to the ability to repay and the ability to pay on time. Um, you know, what I don't like seeing is I don't like see, seeing people that have hopped around. They've had different jobs or they literally maybe they haven't worked for five years and they come in and apply and they've only had their current job for one month. To me, that's not job stability. You know, now if it's like mm-hmm. a husband and wife where the husband's working for five years and he's got job stability, he's been at the same job. The wife just got a job and like they need dual incomes in order for to qualify with us. And maybe she just got a job and there's a story behind why she hadn't been working. Maybe they had kids, you know, and she took a couple of years off, whatever it might be. But she's only been in her current job one year and, you know, she her, her income makes it maybe 30% of the total required income needed. Then maybe we'd make an exception. But um, if the husband, you know, if like he just only been in his job one year, and they you know, they both have recent jobs and don't have a lot of stability, been hopping around, then then I would have a concern. Then I'd have to understand more about the position and more about why they've been hopping around or more why they haven't had a job in the past. Whatever the reason be or whatever the reasoning is, you know, what's happened with their employment history. So um, any thoughts on that, Charles? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to look at the type of employment that they're doing. I mean, you can, uh, one of the things that that you'll run into as well in this business is you'll get a lot of general laborers for for contractors that come in and, and, and they'll apply to live in your community. And that stuff, it's really hard to verify income on those people because a lot of them get paid under the table. It's, it's really challenging to talk to their employers because a lot of them don't want to talk to you. And, um, you know, as long as they have the work, they get paid well, but when the work dries up, then then their job pretty much goes away. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you definitely want to take a look at who they work for. You know, it's probably better to take in a tenant that that may make less working at Walmart than maybe a roofer that that makes twenty five or twenty to twenty five dollars an hour and but, you know, maybe in the wintertime all of his work goes away. Yeah. So you need to um to be careful with with the types of uh you know, labor that person is doing. Mm-hmm. And then another thing that um, I want to mention here is uh, every once in a while we'll get an application that will show that the person makes, you know, $5,000 a month, which, you know, in a lot of our communities, that's a lot of money. You know, that'd be $60,000 a year. They'll, they'll put on their application, they make, you know, four or $5,000 a month. And then I'll look on their credit and I'll see that they don't pay any of their bills on time. They've got credit cards that they just don't pay. <laughs> They've got collections, you know, from, uh, you know, Dish Network and T Mobile and everything else. And, you know, I start questioning, okay, well, you make that much money? Why the heck, heck don't you pay any of your bills? You know, I mean, so that doesn't make me feel all warm and fuzzy. In fact, I'd rather see that they make, you know, $1,500 a month. Then at least the story makes sense. Okay, well, you just don't make enough money. You have all these debts. You just don't make enough money to pay it. Well, yet you, you make plenty of money, but yet you still aren't responsible enough to pay your bills on time. So I, I, we see those things every once in a while. And it's just, it's always a, you know, big red flag for me as well. When they say they make so much money, they try to make you feel comfortable saying how much money they make. But when you really dig into it, you find out that it's either a complete lie or that they just, it doesn't matter how much money they make. They're still very, very irresponsible with it. Um, Charles, let's talk about the number of residents living in a home. And, uh, you know, this is one of those things where this happens quite often as well. And this is something you need to train your manager for. And, you know, we always want to know how many people are going to be living in the home. I mean, is it a husband and wife? Is it a husband, wife, and children? Is it a husband, wife, children, and maybe a mother-in-law? You know, just want to know how many residents are living there. And, uh, you know, there's there's been cases where a prospective tenant shows up and maybe says that just the home's just for her, and yet she's got a guy with her and says that maybe they're just friends or whatever. Maybe she's got a, an entire family in tow. Maybe there's got, like, three other ladies and a couple kids, this, that, and the other, and yet, no, oh, they're just hanging out with me. I'm just – they're just – coming with me along for the ride to see the unit or whatever it might be. But um, you want to just put out your feelers and dig a little deeper to find out really who's going to be living there. And, and we see it quite often where people try to sneak others in. And uh, so you just really want to know who's going to be living there. Is that guy that she's with? I mean, is she just not saying that he's going to be living there because he's got a bad background? He's got evictions. He's got, uh, you know, some other kind of um, uh, derogatory history that we sh- probably don't want to know about. Um, Charles, what do you, how do you handle those situations or how do you tell our managers to handle those situations when we've got, you know, potential homes that might have more residents than what we anticipated? 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, there's two different things that that happen. I mean, the manager. This is where it kind of comes into play to have the manager live in the community, where it's an advantage to have them live in the community. So, if you have someone that applied to the home and they're, let's say, they're they're I don't know, their uh, felon boyfriend wants to move in with them. Um, this is really where. You know, you kind of put it on the manager. I mean, the, the manager also lives in that community. They probably don't want a felon living in there too. So, you know, you need to, to have them look out for those types of things. And it's in the manager's interest to do that as well because it's also their community that they live in. Um, you know, on top of that, you know, you just really have to think through that. I mean, it wasn't maybe about six months ago I had we had somebody – it was a it was a mother with uh, I think she had four children trying to get a two bedroom mobile home, and you know just morally I, it's really hard to wrap your mind around uh, this mother living in the master bedroom and four of her kids living in a in a tiny ten by twelve room at the other end of the trailer. It's 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 really uh, you know we obviously denied her um, for that. But have you ever gone on Instagram, Charles, and seen like those quad bunk beds that they make? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. But yeah, they do. Yeah. Make, they do make like four person bunk beds, so that might work in that situation. But no, I mean, it's I just, guess, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, it just, just make sure. And that, and you know, that, a lot of it comes back to having a manager in the park. I mean, we, we, um, you know, we do have one community right now where we do not have a manager that lives in the park, and um, it's just we had, we adopted her when we purchased the the, the, the community, and so. You know, the challenge with that situation is that she's not there in the evening to see when people come home from work, to see when there's five cars sitting in front of the house versus there should be one because only Mrs. Jones lives there, not Miss Jones and her, her four buddies or, or whatever, her the, or the five kids that live with her. So anyway, just you want to, I, I don't know what else to say here, Charles, other than just verify, make sure that you really dig deep when you're actually showing units and you're pre-screening tents to potentially live in your community. Make sure that you know who is going to be living there. Um this is a, the last one I want to talk about here, Charles. Before we um, before we move on here and say goodbye with the show, is this is something that was brought to our attention that I had to think about a little bit. And I know that we've gone through this scenario ourselves, and we've gone through this this whole thought process of you know we have these different rules, and we want people that are financially able to pay, them, but we also want to make sure they don't have like massively dinged credit history as well. And that, again, that kind of ties in with their ability to pay and whether or not they will pay us. Um, but you know, we have we have parks to where there's tenant owned homes, to where the tenants own a home they just rent the dirt from us. In those scenarios, there's more skin in the game for them. You know, if, if they don't pay their rent, they lose their home. And there's really nowhere cheaper they can live. You know, if they're paying a lot rent of two fifty or three dollars a month, there's literally nowhere else in the area that they could possibly live that cheap. Okay. So they've got skin in the game. They it, it's very rarely do we find a tenant that defaults that that actually owns their own home. Well, on the flip side of that, with rent to owns or with regular rentals, you get defaults because they don't own a home, so they have as much skin in the game. Even rent to owns, they kind of are just glorified rentals, and so they just they don't really have the same skin in the game as someone that actually owns their home today. And so we get situations where people come in, they want to um, pay cash for something, they want to buy it outright. They're going to keep it in the park. They're going to turn into tenant owned or, or to tenant owned renters, meaning they're going to rent the dirt from us. They're going to own the home. They've got a lot of skin in the game, but yet you might pull their background and pull their credit and find that they might not have qualified based on either their payment history or maybe other factors as well um, if you were looking at them as rent owners or just regular renters. So, Charles, you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I know that you know there's exceptions to the rule in every scenario, but you want to speak to this a little bit of when we might make an exception for someone that's buying the home versus someone that's just doing a rent-to-own or just wanting to rent it on an annual basis? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with how much the home is when you're selling it. I mean, I, that home in Blackburn, that guy came in with fifteen thousand cash. So if he defaults, I I know that it's going to take us about six months lost to lease on our lot rent to get that home back. You know, so if we have to kick him out and we take his home back through abandoned property, I know we can get it back and still be, you know, pretty much on top. But if you're selling a home for like twenty five hundred dollars on a handyman special. And your lot rents three hundred dollars a month, and you you know you sell the home, and, and the guy you know he defaults, and you kick him out, and then have to go through the six month process. Well, you've you've essentially broken even on your loss to lease, and and, and then also wasted a bunch of time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think you have to think through like how much the home is. Uh, you also need to think through well, what is the actual, what would be the thing that would make him uh, not qualify? Is it is it a criminal thing or is it how much money he makes or is it a credit thing? You know, cause those things matter. If it's a criminal thing, you probably just ought to not let him in anyways, even if he's paying cash. Um, 
if it's a credit thing, then, you know, if it's not one of those big ones like their housing or their car or their utilities, then you can probably make an exception. Uh, you know, if it's, you know, if it's something else, then, you know, you just have to, to kind of look at the, the, the grand scheme of things mm-hmm. and, uh, and evaluate it from there. Yeah, no, I think you made a great point about the actual <laughs> value of the trailer itself. Um, you know, you're better off always having an empty trailer than selling it, getting twenty five hundred dollars in your pocket, and then realize six months down the road that you've either got a pain in the butt tenant that you let move in there because you made some exceptions. You know, your neighbors are unhappy now that are living on either side of them, or they just they stop paying a couple months in. You've got to go through this abandoning, you know, number one eviction, and then also the abandoned title process, which is timely, it's expensive, and six or eight months down the road, you're back where you started again. But now actually the trailer's in worse condition than what it was when you actually gave it to them. So you don't, you're, you're, you don't make it, make it ahead whatsoever. And so you just, I think every, every scenario is a case by case basis, but like the guy that Charles had mentioned, it paid 15,000 for the trailer from us. Uh, he didn't have any credit history. And so, you know, we would have probably scrutinized it a little bit more if he was doing like a rent to own, uh, or even just, we don't do regular rentals, but we do rent to owns, but, uh, we would have scrutinized him probably a little bit more, if that's what he wanted, but being that he had fifteen thousand dollars cash, uh, a certified check or certified funds, you know what? I was very happy with that, right? I mean, he's, I mean, he's, I mean, he's got, he's got a lot of skin in the game, and there's very few things that would, you know, make him just walk away, get up and walk away. So, Charles, anything else you want to add yep. uh, to our conversation today? that you feel is relevant to uh, the listener base in terms of vetting. I mean, really, guys, everything we just talked about here, I mean, in all honesty, everything that we just talked about, most of this falls underneath common sense. You know, it really does. I mean, just look at these people, look at their background, look at their history, hear their story, listen to their story. Does it make sense? Does it fit together? I mean, everyone's credit in their background when you're looking at it. If you're not, okay, let me let me start off. If you're not pulling this stuff, then you're making a big mistake. You've got to pull the backgrounds. You've got to pull credit, okay? So number one, you have to do that. But then also look at it and put together a pattern, create a pattern out of it. You'll see that everyone's credit and, and financial history, it tells a story. And they'll also tell you their own story of why this happened or why that happened. And it's your job to see if it makes sense, right? I mean, you know, put, put the pieces of the puzzle together and see if it all makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then there's a lie somewhere. And more than likely, it's not on the factual data that you have sitting in front of you from the credit bureaus or from, uh, you know, from the national criminal check that you just did. Um, and so you, you want to try to punch holes in the story and, and either have a reason why you want to sell to them or rent to them or why you don't want to sell to them or rent to them and that's really what it comes down to so anything else man before we uh before we say goodbye for today no i think that's it okay well good deal guys well that's all we have for today's episode but uh before we actually say goodbye we want to remind you of the free gift that we offer to listeners who take the time to leave a five-star rating review on itunes we're going to give you the exact cold call script that we use in our very own mobile home park business and uh, as you guys know we do a lot of direct mail campaigns we also do a lot of cold calling and we buy a good majority of our parks from our cold calling efforts so if you're serious about this business and serious about really taking it to the next level then you need to be cold calling park owners directly and this script will really put you on your path to success, okay? So here's how you're going to redeem this free gift from us. After you submit your review on iTunes, go ahead and send us an email to gift at mobilehomeparkacademy.com and tell us who you are and what screen name you use to leave the review, and we'll go ahead and send you your free gift. Also, be sure to stop by the Mobile Home Park Academy website at mobilehomeparkacademy.com. You can listen to all of our pre- previous podcast episodes as well as get your free copy of our popular ebook, which is the 21 Biggest Mistakes Investors Make When Purchasing Their First Mobile Home Park and How to Avoid Them. And um, yeah, that's it's free, guys. You, you really have nothing to lose by downloading. I mean, it's got a ton of information. As you guys have probably heard on our previous shows, a lot of the guests that are actually active in the business that own parks today, uh, they get a lot of value from this book. So go grab a copy of that, and um, especially if you're just getting started. I mean, if you're just getting started, having bought your first park yet, you definitely need to be reading that book. I mean, that you need to use that as your as your guide, as your park buying guide, so that you avoid some of these big expensive mistakes that might happen and that we see happen to new park investors. So, so guys, that's all we have here for today. This is your host, Kevin Bob, Charles Dehart, signing off. Congratulations for taking the necessary steps to achieving massive success through the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Be sure to visit our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com, to download your free digital ebook version of the 21 biggest mistakes investors make when buying their first mobile home park and how you can avoid them. And while you're there, 
Be sure to subscribe to our free monthly mobile home park investing newsletter, which is jammed full of valuable tips, tricks, and strategies to help you accelerate your path to success as a mobile home park investor. More information about this podcast and its hosts can be found by visiting mobilehomeparkacademy.com.